Otto German has spent 44 years here at the College of Charleston, now serving as an assistant athletic director here at the College of Charleston. In this edition of Quintus Close-Ups, I sit down with him one-on-one -on -one to talk about his years here at the College of Charleston, his time as a basketball player, and growing up in Mount Pleasant. Be sure to download the free Quintus Close-Ups app in your Apple or Google Play stores. Well, Otto, it is so good to see you. Pleasure to be here. Oh, uh, man, you, when I think of a trailblazer, I think of you. We were just talking off camera about your 44 years at College Charleston as an employee. Mm -hmm. But you were telling me that this coming fall, you guys are going to celebrate, as when you became, when became a student here, your 50th uh, year as far as integrating African Americans. Talk to me more about that. Okay, well, you know, we're, we're doing a milestone of black alumni accomplishments this year through the Alumni Association. And they're going to have a, a rollout of the accomplishment of some of our black graduates. But getting back to the point that the college opened its doors to African Americans back in 1967. So this commemorates 50 years of integration on this campus. And uh, I came along. Uh, two years after that date, uh, the wet air, 18-year-old uh, uh, coming in as a recruited student athlete, and, uh, and I chose to come here for three basic reasons. One, it was going to be an academic challenge to me, and uh, I wanted to be a part of change because the college of Charleston was in the early stages of changes, and it was still a predominantly uh, white private institution. As a matter of fact, uh, the fall of 69 was the last year that the College of Charleston uh, was a uh, private institution. We became a state sports school in January of 1970. And, uh, and the third reason being that uh, you know, as a local basketball player, I didn't have to reestablish myself as, as, a, as, a, as an athlete. Sure. And uh, to be honest with you, I wanted to go to an HBC school, but uh, SC State, SC State, right? It, it didn't work out. And uh, then my mother uh, said to me, "Son, you're going to go where you want it. The College of Charleston has shown interest in you since you started playing basketball." So that ended up being the, my choice. Yeah. But you know, coming to the College of Charleston. Uh, wasn't a, a big shock to me from the standpoint of, of being a minority on a predominantly white environment simply because uh, when I left Lang High School in, in 65 and enrolled in Moultrie right. in 65, uh, that was uh, when the journey really began because uh, I was among a few black students at that institution, so I helped to integrate uh, Moultrie High, right. and so coming here wasn't that big of a deal because been there, done that, experienced that, and going back to my days at Moultrie, uh, I only played two years of high school basketball there, uh, simply because of the hurdles and this and that, right. yeah, and then in my junior year, I was able, able to get on the team, and, and that's when it, everything for me started to fall in place. Right from the standpoint of uh, getting some visibility and recognition as, as, a, as an athlete. And then not only that, uh, it was imperative that I do my schoolwork in order to have that opportunity uh, to play sports in high school. And, and so that sort of carried over here to the College of Charleston that had a reputation of being a very, very good school academically, uh, but didn't have that reputation athletically. So. You know, coming here and being part of a, a relatively small athletic department, uh, the competition wasn't that great, but, you know, we played an old Dixie Conference in basketball. We were a non-scholarship program at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I just wanted to be a part of, of, of changing that. And, and uh, when I look at what we have today yeah. in terms of our athletic success, our academic success, and knowing that I helped pave the way along with Remus Harper right. to, uh, to bring down some of the barriers that give African Americans an opportunity to get a good quality, solid education here at the College of Charleston. 
You talk about change. Obviously, last week, I believe, you guys brought in Chad Holbrook as the new baseball coach. Mm -hmm. When you think of Chad Holbrook, what sticks out to you? Well, you know, uh, a guy that's had measurable success at his craft. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, in that situation, it is what it is. Yes, yeah. And uh, you're, you're in the business of, uh, in athletics, of hiring the best candidates. Yes. And let me get back to, you. obviously, your 44 years here at the College of Charleston. Mm -hmm. Like you said, you've seen a lot of change, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that I have. Gosh, what big memory sticks out in your mind when, you, when we sit here right now? The biggest memory for me is in May of 1973 when I uh, walk across the cistern to receive my degree because uh, the odds, you know, was probably against me of, of achieving that. Uh, you know, I'm the second of eight children. Mm. Uh, my mother had a seventh grade uh, education. Uh, my father, my biological father, uh, died when I was nine months old, so I don't even know my biological father. And I have a great uh, stepfather that was instrumental in a number of things that I've done in my life. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but that's the most memorable thing for me, and, uh, and to capitalize that is that my parents, my mom and my, uh, my stepfather, they weren't even here because uh, he was military. Right. And entering my senior year in college, uh, he got assigned to overseas duty and uh, I chose not to to go with them because I didn't want to forego my final year here at the College of Charleston. I wanted to earn my degree from the college. So my older sister and I, we, we remained behind and uh, did, did what we needed to do to survive. And you know, you talk about you being the second child of really eight children. Mm -hmm. I know this is a silly question, but how did you stand out in your mind? Right now, I, I think I stand out is uh, everybody thinks I'm the oldest. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, uh, I guess from a standpoint of maturity level. Mm -hmm. I only I, I, I have six sisters and one brother, uh -huh. all of whom I love very dearly. Right. And, uh, and not all of them went to college, but uh, I have a younger sister, the two youngest, uh, a sister and brother. Uh, both played basketball, both are. Uh, went to college. As a matter of fact, my sister graduated from the college of really? Charleston and my brother graduated from Lander University. Right. And he went on to Lander to uh, establish his own uh, identity as a, 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 a district six point guard. Mm -hmm. did, did very well. Yeah. And obviously you were very famous here as the best basketball player. Uh, I don't know about that. <laughs> I, I, I don't know about that. that hey, I, I always tell people that's in the eyes of the beholder. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, when I, when I look back at, you know, comparison of, right. of, uh, of ability, I think you have to base that on the era of which people played. Right. And uh, so, yeah, I, I may have been, you know, good doing that era, but when you look at how the game has changed so much today right. and the science and everything that goes into right. preparing the athletes to play, uh, it, it's different. It's a different world. Uh, I could remember we played with a lot of aches and pains because we just didn't have the resources. And, uh, you know, I, I can remember us taping our own ankles and uh, playing with crooked fingers. You know, and, uh, today's a little bit different, yeah. uh, tremendously different. different yeah. And obviously you, you know, played for what, two years over at the I played two years at Moultrie yeah. and played four years here. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's... Uh, the. The thing in coming here is that my basketball skills uh, allowed me an opportunity to get an education. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that's what our people have to understand now uh, with the cost of education yes. being the way that it is. Uh, your athletic skills, if you're that good and you can get to this level, it will help finance mm -hmm. uh, getting your, your degree. Mm -hmm. Because you know, a long time ago, it used to be that you needed a, a high school degree, a high school diploma right. uh, to have a chance. Now it's a college degree, but we live in a changing world. We're in an age of technology yeah. now, and it's like you know, a revolving cycle. It's going to get back to where with technology being the way it is, 
that maybe getting just a high school diploma is going to be enough to be a survivor in this world. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it, you know, it's a cycle. Mm -hmm. You talk about education, but who was Otto German as a high school student? Uh, I would say as a high school student, and I use this phrase all the time uh, when I talk to my athletes, I said, you know, I wasn't the, the, the smartest guy, but I wasn't the dumbest guy in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, you are, I, I, I attribute a lot to uh, taking a common sense approach to everything that I do. Uh, it's not all about me. Uh, I did okay in high school and I did okay at the College of Charleston. I'm not going to sit here and say I, I was a, uh, an A student and I'm going to say I was an F student. I got a college degree. Right. <laughs> and the bottom line is that uh, you know, I think if we take a common sense approach to a lot of things that we do, life can be so much easier for you. Yes, indeed. You know, because uh, as I said, it's not all about me. I'm a big believer in uh, I treat people the way I want to be treated. I speak to people the way I want to be spoken to. And I think if you can, you know, anchor yourself that way, you're going to be able to get along with people. People will have greater respect for you. And uh, always be a good listener yes. because I, I feel as though you could learn from anybody mm -hmm. and you don't know it all. We don't know it all. Right. You know, we're not perfect. The only perfect being is the big guy upstairs. God. Mm -hmm. You know, besides the College of Charleston, mm -hmm. obviously I want to take you back to some place that you also know, which is home, Mount Pleasant. Oh, Mount Pleasant, a great city. What is the biggest difference between when you were growing up to right now in your mind? Well, growth. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mount Pleasant was a small town. Everybody knew each other. Right. Uh, you, you, particularly, I grew up in the old village. Yes. Yes. And what I see there now is just disheartening. And, and when I say that is that I think that people are selling property and uh, million dollar homes are being built and what was known as the old village as it relates to African Americans, may, five, ten years from now may not exist simply because uh, big homes are being built mm -hmm. and uh, they're not affordable. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I say not affordable, I'm talking about particularly African Americans and, and even some whites that can't afford uh, 1.5 million dollar homes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so it's changing. It's not what it used to be. And uh, I see situations uh, back in the day when I grew up, you know, you hate to say, but it is true, it was segregated. We had the black playground, we had the white playground. <laughs> we dare not go on the white playground, and they dare not come on the black playgrounds. But now, you know, you, you see the complete reverse, and which is a good thing. Right. Because uh, there's only one God. And we all got to learn to live together. Yes, right. And, uh, you know, because I can remember with my children, I have three children, and when, we, when they were young, and we would sit at the dinner table, and we'd ask them how was school today. And they, they would identify kids by race, and we had to stop them. Mm -hmm. That's not the way you identify people. Right. Uh, they're your schoolmates, classmates, know their names. That's how I grew up. Mm -hmm. We never judge based on color. Yes, My mother used to say, don't judge the book by the cover. Right. You got to open the book and find out what the, the contents. And, and, you know, even though she only had a seventh grade education, she was a wise woman. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. And she was the 13th out of 14 children. Wow. Mm -hmm. And you talk about, obviously, the Gold Village. And, you know, when I go around into that neighborhood, I always see the sweet shop over there. Oh, yeah, <laughs> the sweet shop. Well, to be honest with you, you see that little, that, that playground right, right there? Right, right, that, That's where I learned how to play basketball. Oh. That's where I learned how to play basketball. You know, uh, we uh, we be there throughout the week. We used to do it on Sundays, but there, there was a golden rule on Sunday. Because my church is right there. Right, yes. Friendship right, AME yeah, yeah. is right there. Hey, you could not be on the basketball court on Sundays until after church is mm -hmm. over with. Because if, you, if you're out there, matter of fact, you really should be in church. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and I, I, you know, I uh, 
we, we respected that. We respected our elders, which is sometimes a, a missing thing now where uh, the, the younger people don't respect their elders. Uh, I, I tell the story to my grandchildren, and I got ten of them. Ooh. I got ten grands and, and three great grands. Wait. And uh, we would tell the story that if we walked past our elders ten times a day, we had to acknowledge them yes. ten times a day. That's unheard of now. That's unheard of. And I, I, I think so much has gone on with politics and we, we're, they've taken parenting out of parenting. Mm -hmm. Because the discipline that you and I may have received when we came up, Boom, that's, right. yeah, that's, that's unheard of mm -hmm. now. And uh, you know, for me, I, I don't think you can raise a child through a textbook. You, you have to raise a child through reality. This is what, you know, what it is. Mm -hmm. Let me recap because we're sitting here at the College of Charleston's TV yeah, arena. Yeah, yeah. When you think of the College of Charleston and the athletics department in five to ten years, what do you say? Well, there's there's a lot that has gone on in athletics in, in my tenure here, and I uh, take great pride in the fact that uh, I see change. Uh, I never thought that I would live to see the day where the College of Charleston uh, would have two African-American head coaches yes. and uh, in the sport of men's and women's basketball. Right. And then when you compare when I was here to now, I never thought I'd see the day in my sport that the predominant race is African-American as opposed to right. you know, uh, what it was when I came. I was truly the minority, uh, Remus and I, when we played basketball here. And, uh, but, you know, time brings on changes. My dad used to always tell me, if you live long enough, you're going to see change. Mm -hmm. And uh, hopefully it's a change for the positive because uh, you know, African Americans have every right to be here. But I don't want African Americans here just because they're African Americans. This is a difficult school academically, and I'm not a big fan of setting anybody up for failure. I'd like to see those of us who are here that, you know, you have uh, a better than 50% chance of experiencing academic success as opposed to academic failure. Mm -hmm. You know, I've worked in the admissions office for 13 years uh, as part of my tenure here at the College of Charleston. And just to repeat, I will see kids here just because they're black. Uh, you have to compete in the classroom. That's where it counts. And I don't want to ever be a part of creating a revolving door syndrome that one comes in just because they're an African American. No, I want them to be an African American who can be competitive in the classroom sure. and experience measurable success in the classroom. Uh, it's all about academics. I tell my athletes, hey, if you don't do it in the classroom, you're not going to do it in the sport. Mm -hmm. Because this is what it's all about. All of our athletes have to understand that less than 1% of them will go on to the next level as to where the sport in which they're playing is actually going to put money in their pocket. So it's imperative that you get your education so that if it doesn't work athletically, you got your college degree to fall back on right. and you can be a functional member of society. I mean, that's what it's all about. You know, and we, we have to, I try to keep it real. Sure. Because I had that dream too. <laughs> Look where I am. Right. And see, the opportunities uh, to get to the next level now, you know, if, if you don't get to the NBA, you can probably go uh, in Europe and play for a while, right. but then it ends there. Mm -hmm. But it's imperative that, that all of our athletes, black, white, pink, blue, whatever, right. get your college degree. And if you're good enough, uh, let's complete that cycle of education first, because the money's always going to be there. 
and uh, the, the, uh, let's get anchored in education, and uh, so that if things don't work out athletically, you got your academics to fall back on, and you can go out and, and be a functional, productive member of society. That's what it's all about for me, and, and, and that's the message that I try to preach to. The, the young folks, whenever I have a speaking engagement, it, no, it's, it's got to be, let's get prepared academically because that's the foundation that's going to determine your future as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. If you've got the athletic skills, that's just an additive. It can ease the pressure of is how you obtain that, that, uh, that education. Auto German, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate this. Hey, my pleasure, man. This, hey, that was great. Oh, thank you.